Welcome to our video about 5 tragic crimes that shook the world. In this video, we'll take a closer look at the stories behind each crime, from the events leading up to the tragedy to the aftermath and impact on society. These crimes left a lasting impression on the world, and we hope that by sharing their stories, we can raise awareness and remember the victims. Tina Herman was a 32-year-old woman who lived in Howard, Ohio. She was a trusted employee at the local Dairy Queen restaurant. All of a sudden, she stopped showing up for work. Tina wasn't responding to calls and texts either. Tina's manager, Valerie Haythorn, drove over to her house to check on her. Tina's car was in the driveway along with another unknown car. Tina's house lights were on inside. But Valerie felt that something wasn't right. So she called the police. She told them that Tina didn't show up for work, which was unusual. Valerie had stopped by Tina's house and knocked on the door, but no one answered. She left her note. Two different police officers checked Tina's residence at different times. But no one answered the door when they knocked. So they left the matter unresolved. That was until the authorities discovered that Tina's two children, Sarah and Cody Maynard, didn't attend school the next day. Sarah and Cody were 13 and 10. Then the police received a call from a concerned boyfriend. The boyfriend told them that his girlfriend, Stephanie Sprang, was missing. Stephanie was 41 and Tina's good friend. Stephanie was with Tina on Wednesday, November 10, 2010, before they both went missing. Meanwhile, Valerie was very worried about Tina. She decided to take matters into her own hands. Valerie went to Tina's house again. She discovered that Tina's car was no longer in the driveway. Only the other car remained. Valerie knocked on Tina's door, but she got no response. Without wasting another second, she entered the house through an open window on the back porch. There was blood in the bathroom, on the carpet, and splatters everywhere. Yet Tina and her children weren't inside the house. Valerie called the police. The police arrived at Tina's house in a matter of minutes. There were four possible related disappearances, Tina, Stephanie, Sarah, and Cody. The family dog, Tanner, was also missing. The police searched Tina's house. The evidence they found indicated that there was assault with bodily injury. They found blood all over the house. Blood on the stairs, in the basement, in the bathroom, on the carpet. There were blood splatters and drag marks everywhere. Then there were Walmart shopping bags with tarps and a box of trash bags in the house. The purchase receipt was still inside. The first suspect was Tina's ex-boyfriend. Tina and her ex were in the middle of a breakup. Tina's friends worried that he hurt her in the process. He couldn't be trusted. The investigators learned that Tina still lived with him after the breakup. But her ex-boyfriend was conveniently away during the time of the disappearances. Gregory Borders usually had Wednesdays off work. But he decided to work overtime at Target Distribution Center on the Wednesday of Tina's disappearance. Gregory told the authorities that he didn't come back home after he clocked out. He stayed at his friend's house in Urbana. Gregory and his friend had planned to play golf the next day. Gregory was informed about Tina's disappearance by his mother on Thursday. He didn't panic. He continued to play golf with his friend. Gregory realized the seriousness of the matter only when he returned home. The police contacted Gregory's friend. And the friend assured the authorities that he was with Gregory all that time. They had dinner together on Wednesday before they watched TV. Then they spent the next day golfing. So Gregory was cleared as a suspect. Meanwhile, the investigators focused on the Walmart receipt they had found. They investigated the surveillance footage from the Walmart in the area. The receipt also showed that the suspect bought tarps, trash bags, a turkey sandwich, and a t-shirt, along with other things. The investigators soon found their person of interest. He was a white man aged between 25 and 40. He had brown hair. And he wore a camouflage shirt on the day of the purchase. The man left Walmart in a silver Toyota Yaris. 
the authorities obtained a copy of the receipt for the man's transaction from Walmart. Then they compared the product codes to the receipt they found at the crime scene. It was a match. The investigators searched for all the people who owned a silver Toyota Yaris in Ohio. They soon found a name, Matthew J. Hoffman, through DMV records. A deeper investigation into Matthew revealed that he was 30 and a tree trimmer. And he lived only 10 miles away from Tina's house. He was once stopped by the police wearing a camouflage shirt similar to the one in the Walmart video. He was also pulled over near the area where Tina's car was dumped. Tina's car was discovered abandoned in a parking lot of a university. Also, Matthew had a history of domestic violence. The police found Matthew sleeping on his couch. There were large piles of leaves on the floor and bags of leaves stacked up against walls. But the biggest discovery of all was found in his basement. Tina's daughter, Sarah, was in a sleeping bag on top of a pile of leaves in Matthew's basement. Her feet and hands were tied with a yellow rope and also duct taped. Sarah wore a makeshift diaper that was made using a plastic bag. And she was confused. Sarah stated that she was late for school. She also asked after her dog. Sarah was taken to the hospital, where she successfully recovered. Matthew was arrested and questioned. He later admitted that he observed Tina's home from the woods the night before the attack. The next day, he watched as everyone left the house. Then he sneaked inside. His plan was to rob the house. But Tina and Stephanie returned home early. Then Matthew attacked and killed them. Matthew killed the family dog because it wouldn't stop barking. Then he attacked Sarah and Cody when they got home from school. Matthew killed Cody. Then he kept Sarah tied up. He took Sarah with him. He chopped up Tina, Stephanie, Cody, and the dog's bodies. He dumped the bodies in garbage bags and placed them in a wooded area inside a hollow beech tree. The police later recovered the remains of Tina, Stephanie, Cody, and the dog. Matthew pleaded guilty to 10 counts, including murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The tree where the bodies were found was cut down. Now that we've heard the story of Tina Herman and her children, let's turn our attention to another tragic crime that shocked the world. On August 22, 1922, the police were called by a bunch of neighbors. There was a disturbance at a house in Los Angeles. Neighbors had reportedly heard gunshots and the lady of the house screaming hysterically. The police arrived at the scene only to find a man lying dead in a pool of blood. A persistent banging came from the master bedroom upstairs. Then the police found the lady of the house locked inside a large wardrobe. Alberta Dolly Korschel was raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, USA. She was born to German immigrants. Dolly began working in a textile mill by the age of 12. The mill was owned by Fred William Ostreich. Fred was a successful fellow German immigrant who often hired other immigrants. Soon enough, Dolly captured Fred's attention. She was beautiful, charismatic, and friendly. Dolly and Fred hit it off. The two got married at the time when Dolly was 17. That made Dolly the housewife of a wealthy textile manufacturer. Nonetheless, Dolly was said to be very unfaithful to her husband from the beginning of their marriage. She would have two to three lovers at a time. And she brought her lovers into her home whilst her husband worked at the mill. After a while, Fred began to suspect that he was losing his mind. He became very forgetful. He misplaced his clothes and his favorite cigars. Then he began hearing things. And Fred heard scratching and scuffling sounds coming from the roof. He asked Dolly if she heard similar sounds. But Dolly never did. So Fred went to see his doctor. And he was told that his stressful job was probably the cause. His doctor prescribed some medication for him. However, Fred found a better prescription, alcohol. Fred delved deeper and deeper into his alcohol addiction by the day. It not only affected his marriage but also worsened his delusions and paranoia. 
Fred began to sense a presence in his house. He'd also catch glimpses of movement at the corners of his eyes. And he often awoke in the night, swearing a ghostly figure had been standing over him. Fred's paranoia went on for around five years. He finally decided that enough was enough. It was time to relocate. So in 1918, Fred and Dolly relocated to Los Angeles. However, everything Fred was trying to escape from followed him to his new house. And that seemed to confirm his fears it wasn't his old house that was the problem. Fred was the one who was losing his grip on reality. So Fred made alcohol his best friend. And he watched as his marriage continued to crumble by the day. Their relationship was highly volatile and packed with constant fights. Or still, Fred suspected that Dolly was cheating on him. One night, the tension between Fred and Dolly blew up into a heated argument. The two screamed at each other. They threatened each other. Then a man burst into the room, two pistols in his hands. In the confusion of the moment, the intruder got into an altercation with Fred. Three shots were fired. Fred fell on the ground dead. The police were soon called only to find a dead man on the floor and Dolly locked up. And some valuables, which included Fred's watch, were missing. After her husband's demise, Dolly wasn't doing a great job of playing the grieving widow. She started sleeping with her personal attorney, Herman Shapiro. Dolly was pretty fond of Herman, and she gifted him a diamond-encrusted watch in 1930. Herman became suspicious. The same diamond watch was reportedly stolen by the burglar who murdered Dolly's husband. Dolly claimed she found the watch in the front yard. Maybe the burglar had mistakenly dropped it. But it didn't take long before the detectives investigating Fred's murder heard about the diamond watch. Then things came crumbling down for Dolly. Her other lover, Roy Klum, snitched on her. Roy told the police that Dolly gave him a pistol to dispose of it after Fred's murder. Then a neighbor also told the police a similar story. The neighbor had buried the other pistol under a rosebush in his garden. The police got their hands on the pistols. And Dolly was arrested. Then Dolly told Herman that he should check on her vagabond half-brother, who was living in their attic. Herman found a thin and pale man in the attic. His name was Otto Sanhuber. And Otto spilled the beans about his affair with Dolly. He described himself as a part sex slave, part secret housekeeper. And he confessed to murdering Fred. So Otto was arrested and charged with manslaughter. It turned out that Otto had been living in Fred and Dolly's attic for more than nine years. Fred was right to suspect that Dolly was having an affair. Dolly took a liking to Otto in 1913 when she first saw him working in Fred's factory. She then told Fred that their sewing machine was broken. Fred sent Otto to fix it the very next day. 17-year-old Otto turned up at Dolly's house only to find out Dolly intended to make him a lover. Thus began a secret love story that lasted for more than a decade. Otto made it a habit to frequent Dolly's house in the name of fixing her sewing machine but neighbors began to whisper behind their backs. So Dolly suggested that Otto should move in with her and stay in their attic. Otto gave up his job, his home, and all contact with the outside world and moved into the attic. Otto spent his time in the attic reading, writing adventure stories, and making bath gin. He'd emerge from his hideout during the day to be with Dolly. Then he kept himself busy doing the housework when his services were not needed. He ironed Fred's clothes, made his bed, polished his shoes, and cooked his dinners. Otto's presence in the house didn't go completely unnoticed. Fred heard noises, saw shadows, and several of his belongings disappeared. That went on for years until Fred decided to move houses. However, Dolly sent Otto ahead of them to the new house. Otto settled again in the attic of the new house. That was until Otto shot Fred dead on the night of the argument. Fred lived with the man who made him believe he was going crazy for nine whole years without even knowing it. That same man murdered him. After the murder, Otto continued to live in the attic for another eight years. He was allowed to use a typewriter this time. 
Dolly escaped a prison sentence after her case ended up in a split jury. Otto confessed to Fred's murder. But his statute of limitations had expired. So Otto walked away a free man. Dolly and Otto went their separate ways. Otto changed his name to Walter Klein and moved to Canada. He married another woman. And the couple later relocated back to Los Angeles. They lived the rest of their lives away from the public eye. Dolly stayed in Los Angeles with her second husband until her death in 1961 at 80 years old. Moving on to our next tragic crime, the tragic case of Laura Boren. Laura Christine Boren and Andre Lee Thomas started dating when they were young students. Laura was eight months younger than Andre. Andre had been deprived of love his whole childhood. He grew up as one of his mother's six children. His mother was seldom present for her children. She suffered from severe mental health problems. Andre's mother often stated that she heard voices coming from the divine. Andre watched his mother sink into more depression by the day. She drank all the time and brought numerous men to the house. So it felt good to finally find someone who showed him love and affection. Andre was born into a family with a strong history of mental illness. It all stretched back to his grandparents. Andre's grandmother stated she heard voices and received visions from God. And Andre's parents were attracted to each other allegedly because of their backgrounds of generational mental illness, violence, and alcoholism. And Andre's parents, too, weren't an exception. But Andre thrived against all odds as a child. He got good grades, and he distracted himself by drawing car designs. As Andre got older, his grades began to reflect the instability he dealt with at home. Then he started getting in trouble with the law. Soon, Andre began telling his school friends that he could hear voices inside his head speaking to him just like his mother and grandmother. Andre also suffered from depression from a young age. He would take a knife to his wrists in an attempt to take his own life. And Andre's mother responded by telling Andre that she wished she had aborted him. Andre and Laura were a charming couple. They always looked so happy with each other. Then Laura got pregnant when they were only 16-year-olds. The two decided to keep the baby. And Laura's family knew a little bit about Andre's criminal past. But they didn't know about the voices he heard inside his head. Andre and Laura soon welcomed a baby boy whom they named Andre Jr. Laura took motherhood seriously. And Andre dropped out of school and worked various jobs so he could take care of his family. The two were wonderful parents. The couple then married and moved in with Andre's mother. But Andre's mother kicked the couple out a few weeks afterward. Then the two ended their marriage after a few months. Their breakup caused Andre's mental health to spiral. He began drinking heavily and taking illegal substances. On one occasion, Andre beat up a man whom he believed had slept with Laura. In another incident, he ran into a church and dunked his head into some holy water. He believed he was possessed by demons. Then in 2003, Andre stabbed his brother. He was arrested and spent three months in jail. Nonetheless, Andre received no treatment for his obvious mental health problems. Andre hoped things would work out and he would get back with Laura. But it didn't turn out that way. Laura moved on with another man, Brian Hughes. The two began living together in Texas, USA. And they had a daughter together. That affected Andre. So Andre told his father he felt he was in a circle that he couldn't break. And he told his friends that he thought of taking his own life. He couldn't stand the sound of his voice anymore, so he began to tape his mouth shut, literally. That's when one of his friends took him to a mental health facility. The staff issued Andre with an emergency order. And they told him to go to a nearby hospital immediately. But Andre left and went home to Texas. Andre refused to let go of Laura. That was despite the fact that Andre had his own girlfriend. So in March 2004, Andre plunged a knife into his chest. His mother found him, and he was rushed to the hospital. The doctors concluded that Andre was psychotic. 
The hospital arranged for Andre to be taken to a mental health facility because he was a danger to himself and others. But Andre fled from the hospital. On March 27, 2004, Andre went into his kitchen and placed three knives into his pockets. Then he made his way over to Laura and Brian's house. He broke inside and set off the security alarm. Laura came running down the hall to see what was happening. Andre pulled out one of the knives. And Andre stabbed Laura in the heart. Laura fell to the ground and began bleeding profusely. Then she died. Andre cut into her chest, carved out a piece of her lung, and placed it into his pocket. Then Andre entered the children's bedroom. He pinned down his own son, stabbed him in the chest, and took out his heart. He placed it into his pocket. Then he turned his attention to Laura and Brian's daughter. He stabbed her, took out her heart, and placed it into his pocket. Laura was 20 years old at the time of her death. Andre Jr. was four, and the little girl was around 13 months old. Andre then stabbed himself. He laid down next to Laura, expecting to die. However, he didn't die. So, Andre fled the scene and went back to his place. Later that day, Andre went to the police and turned himself in. Andre told the police that God had told him to kill the three people, the reason being. Laura was Jezebel, the wife of the devil. His son was the Antichrist. Laura and Brian's daughter was an evil demonic spirit. A few days later, Andre was reading the Bible in his cell when he came across Matthew 5 verse 29. Then Andre plucked out his right eye. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. In Matthew 5 verse 29, the courts declared that Andre wasn't fit to stand trial. They sent him to a maximum security psychiatric facility. Andre was given strong antipsychotic medication and diagnosed with schizophrenia. But doctors soon concluded that Andre had exaggerated his symptoms. They changed his diagnosis to substance-induced psychosis and declared him competent to stand trial. Andre was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. In 2008, Andre removed his other eye, placed it into his mouth, and consumed it. His execution was scheduled for April 5, 2023. Last month. But I'm not sure if he was actually executed or postponed. If you know, tell us in the comments. While the tragic case of Laura Boren was a tragedy that will never be forgotten, it was not the only crime of its kind. Rachel Nichol is another heartbreaking story that we must remember. On a sunny summer morning of July 15, 1992, Rachel Nichol, her toddler Alex, and their beloved pet Molly embarked on a leisurely walk through Wimbledon Common. The vibrant atmosphere of the park was teeming with Londoners, completely oblivious to the lurking danger that was about to strike. As Rachel, Alex, and Molly strolled through a serene section of the park, a vicious attacker seized Rachel. The assailant brutally stabbed her multiple times, tragically ending her life in the presence of her little boy. Following this, he sexually assaulted her, cleansed his hands in a nearby creek, and vanished from the scene. Later, a fellow dog walker stumbled upon Alex, tightly gripping his mother's lifeless body, pleading, please wake up, mummy. The investigation proved challenging for the police, as the only witness was the young Alex, and there was minimal physical evidence. Officers questioned everyone present in Wimbledon Common at that time, but aside from one woman who noticed a man behaving oddly, there were no other significant leads. To aid their investigation, the police enlisted the help of a criminal profiler. The profiler suggested they search for a Caucasian male, likely living in the vicinity, who was youthful, single, and possibly jobless or working in a low-skill position. The individual was presumed to be living alone or with his mother, owning a bicycle but not a car, and having a prior record of sexual misconduct. Additionally, the suspect was likely to struggle in forming relationships with women. The psychologist also theorized that the killer might have an affinity for adult content and potentially martial arts, while being sexually inexperienced and an unsatisfactory partner. 
the police managed to obtain a description of the assailant from young Alex, which led to the creation of a sketch. To garner the public's assistance, they turned to the widely watched 1990s TV show, Crime Watch. In an intense episode, the detective specifically addressed women, stating that they possess a keen intuition for peculiar men and would be able to recognize the traits outlined by the profiler. The detective also reassured potential callers that they would be helping the person in question, as the police would ensure they receive appropriate attention. As is typical for such programs, the police received thousands of calls and soon enough, they identified a man who had been reported multiple times. Moreover, a woman named Julie, the man's former girlfriend, called to reveal that she had met him through a Lonely Hearts column two years prior. She had ended their relationship after he confessed to having sexual fantasies involving a forest and a knife. This man was Colin Stagg. Authorities arrested Colin Stagg, searched his residence, and dealt into his background. Stagg, in his late twenties, was a perfect match for the criminal profile living alone, unemployed, single, and a virgin. During questioning, Stagg was confronted about allegations of him sunbathing nude on Wimbledon Common. He candidly admitted to this behavior. Furthermore, Stagg confessed that he had been walking his dog on Wimbledon Common the day Rachel was murdered. He had even approached a police officer, volunteering his information as a potential witness. Despite their best efforts, the police were unable to extract a confession from Colin Stagg and lacked any physical evidence. Determined to pursue the case, they organized an identity parade with the witness who had seen a man behaving suspiciously on Wimbledon Common prior to Rachel's murder. Unwaveringly, she identified Colin Stagg. Although the authorities couldn't find concrete proof against Stagg, they were convinced he was the perpetrator. Thus, they embarked on one of the most controversial and notorious operations in British policing history, Operation Insel. The objective was to entice Stagg into a relationship with an undercover female officer, hoping that she could coax a confession out of him. Assuming the role of Julie's friend, an officer codenamed Lizzie reached out to Colin, alleging that she had read the letter that had terminated their relationship. Lizzie suggested she was more open-minded than Julie and shared similar sexual fantasies as those Stagg had mentioned in his initial letter. Over the next year, Colin and Lizzie spoke frequently on the phone and exchanged over 40 letters. Believing they were in a relationship, the couple even met for a walk and lunch. During their first encounter, Lizzie divulged her fascination with the occult and sacrificial rituals. She claimed that she and her ex had killed a pregnant woman and her newborn on an altar, drank their blood, and engaged in group sex afterward. This outrageous story had been concocted by the detectives and criminal profiler in the hope that Stagg would reciprocate with a confession of his own. Although Colin did not react to the tale or admit to any crime, he handed Lizzie a note describing a sexual fantasy involving threatening her with a knife on Wimbledon Common. Convinced they were on the verge of obtaining a confession, the police sent Lizzie on more dates with Colin. During their subsequent meeting, Lizzie confided in Colin that the idea of being intimate with a murderer excited her, and she was thrilled that he was a suspect in Rachel's murder. She went on to say that she would definitely sleep with him if he confessed to killing Rachel. However, Colin did not admit to the crime, and when she pressured him for a confession, he pleaded with her not to end their relationship. Despite its failure to obtain a confession or any incriminating evidence, Operation Edsel persisted in focusing solely on Stagg, with detectives unwavering in their belief that he was Rachel's murderer. The operation grew increasingly unethical, culminating in the police arresting Colin and revealing their trump card, Lizzie, dressed in full police uniform, conducted the interview for Rachel's murder. During the interrogation, Lizzie presented all the information she had gathered from their intimate conversations, making a last-ditch effort to secure a confession. Colin countered by claiming he had never believed she had killed anyone on an altar and had merely played along, thinking it was a consensual adult game. With their chances of a confession dashed, the detectives finally charged Colin, who spent 13 months behind bars. When Colin's dag was eventually brought to trial, the judge denounced the evidence obtained through Operation Ansel as the result of deceptive conduct of the grossest kind and deemed it inadmissible. Despite the lack of evidence, the prosecution persisted, but eventually, the case was dropped, and Colin was released. 
Nevertheless, detectives continued to publicly accuse Cullen, even appearing on television to assert his guilt. As the years passed, the case grew colder, and Rachel's family continued to await justice. A decade after Rachel's murder, a dedicated group of experienced detectives revisited the case. They explored new leads, re-examined original witness statements, and reprocessed all physical evidence. Utilizing a novel technique, they discovered previously undetected DNA evidence. Without delay, Colin Stagg was brought into the station for a DNA sample. In 2002, leveraging cutting-edge DNA technology, the police conclusively exonerated Colin Stagg of Rachel Nichols' murder. Colin later filed a lawsuit for damages and was awarded £700,000. He has since become a published author, co-authoring two books that detail his harrowing ordeal. The revamped investigative team hypothesized that Rachel's murder was neither the first nor the last crime committed by her killer. They began examining both old and new cases with similar patterns. As technology progressed, they were able to more efficiently compare evidence and run the DNA profile, which had cleared Colin through the UK's National Crime Database. In 2006, their persistence paid off when they found a match. Robert Knapper had been arrested 16 months after Rachel's murder for the killings of Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine. At the time, Knapper was detained in a high-security psychiatric facility and denied ever being on Wimbledon Common in 1992. Confident they had finally identified the true perpetrator, detectives charged Knapper in November 2007. A year later, he pleaded guilty during the trial. Robert Knapper will remain in prison for the rest of his life. After 16 long years, Rachel and her family at last received the justice they deserved. Our latest story is yet another example of a tragic crime. Allison Bota On December 18, 1994, 27-year-old Allison Bota had spent most of the day soaking up the sun with friends at a beach in her hometown of Port Arthur, South Africa. When it started getting late, she invited everyone back to her flat to hang out and have a bite to eat. At the end of the evening, her guests had bid her farewell and headed home. Since it wasn't safe to walk the streets after dark, Allison had given rides to those who didn't have transportation at the ready. It would be a gracious act that would cost her dearly before the night was through. When she returned to her apartment alone just after 3 a.m., Allison was a bit put out to find that someone had taken her usual parking space in front of the building. Her choice is extremely limited, she had been forced to settle on a spot that was further away than she would have liked. As she was about to get out of the car and go inside, someone opened the driver's side door. Before she had time to react, a man put the blade of a knife to her throat and told her to slide into the passenger seat and keep quiet or he would kill her then and there. Allison did as she was told in the hopes that the menacing stranger would release her unharmed if she cooperated with his demands. As they drove off into the darkness, he told her that his name was Clinton and that he simply wanted to borrow her car. He promised that he would let her go in short order if she behaved. Having never before been in the presence of true evil, she had believed him. When the man she knew as Clinton pulled onto a side street and came to a stop, it hadn't been to set Allison free but rather to let an even more threatening presence into the car. She would later say that when she looked in the rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of the figure in the back seat, she knew that she was in trouble. While the driver had at least made the effort to fake cordiality up to that point, his partner had glowered at her as a predator would its intended prey. Instead of freeing her, Allison's abductors had taken her to a remote spot on the outskirts of the city. Once there, they had thrown her on the ground amidst piles of broken glass and scattered debris. After informing her that she was going to be raped, Clinton had asked if she planned on fighting back. Still holding on to the notion that he would make good on his promise to let her go, she had assured him that she would cooperate if it meant seeing her family again. Seemingly satisfied with her response, Clinton had proceeded to sexually assault his terrified captive in every way imaginable. When he was finished, he had turned her over to his accomplice, who had frightened her from the moment she had laid eyes on him. As she braced herself for what was to come, he had proceeded to viciously rape Allison while simultaneously choking her. As she drifted in and out of consciousness, she had lost control of her bodily functions, 
causing her to evacuate her bowels. While this hadn't seemed fortuitous at the time, this natural reflex may very well have helped save her life. Having been arrested on rape charges in the past, the men had decided in advance that the only way to avoid jail time would be to make sure that their future victims couldn't go to the police. With this in mind, once they had their fill, they had taken turns stabbing Allison in the abdomen. By the time they were through, she had sustained 37 penetrating wounds to her midriff, causing her intestines to spill out onto the ground. As her would-be killers stood around chatting and admiring their handiwork, they had been surprised to see that the object of their brutality was still breathing. In an attempt to finish the job, Franz had knelt over her and sliced her throat 16 times with deadly precision. Despite her grave injuries, Allison had been aware of his hand moving back and forth in front of her face as he slashed her so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. Once they were certain that she was well and truly dead, the men had dropped all pretenses and called each other by their proper names as they climbed into Allison's car and prepared to head back to the city. As the headlights disappeared into the night, the ravaged young woman miraculously regained consciousness. As she lay broken and discarded in the middle of nowhere, literally flayed open, Allison wrote a farewell note in the sand. After letting her mother know one last time that she loved her, she had scrawled Franz and the Uns so that whoever found her body would know the first names of the men who were responsible for her death. Though it probably would have been easier for her to lay down and wait for the inevitable, Allison hadn't been ready to give up on life just yet. Aware that she had to get help fast or the choice to live would no longer be hers, she had pulled herself up and started walking towards the road. As she took the first step, she noticed that her line of vision was impaired to such an extent that she couldn't see what lay ahead. It was only when she put her hands to her face that she realized that her neck had been almost completely cut through, making it impossible for her to hold her head upright. Just as she was coming to terms with the severity of her injuries, she felt something went around her ankles. Holding her head in place so that she could look down, she saw that her intestines were bunched up at her feet. Determined to make it to safety or die trying, Allison, who was completely naked and covered in blood, had to figure out a way to put her body back together before continuing. After discovering that her assailants had left her clothes behind, she had used her shirt to fashion a sling with which to carry her displaced innards. As she held the precious bundle with one hand, she used the other to hold her head in place. With her physical form more or less intact, she resumed her trek to find help. The walk to the nearest road was a long and arduous one, made all the more difficult by Allison's precarious condition. Even so, whether by sheer force of will, divine intervention or a combination of the two, she managed to make it to the highway. She would later say that she felt as if she had been carried by a force she could neither see nor explain. Since it was the middle of the night, traffic was all but non-existent. Still, Allison held out hope that an angel would find her in the darkness and lead her to the light. Against all odds, she got her wish. No longer able to carry on, Allison had collapsed in the roadway. As she lay on the pavement, her life slipping away, she saw headlights approaching in the distance. When the car reached her, the driver had slowed down long enough to take a look before speeding off without offering assistance. Moments later, she heard another vehicle coming towards her. This time, rather than passing her by, it had stopped. Her angel had found her. In a stroke of luck, a 20-year-old veterinary student from Johannesburg named Tyan Eilert had been taking the scenic route with a friend that put them in the right place at the right time. Somehow, all the stars had lined up and they had spied Allison lying in the middle of the road. Rather than driving on, as the motorist before them had done, they had felt compelled to render aid. While his friend called for an ambulance on his mobile phone, Tyan had knelt down and gently maneuvered Allison's protruding trachea back in place. He had then covered her with his shirt before taking hold of her hand and reassuring her that help was on the way. For whatever reason, it had taken the ambulance nearly 45 minutes to make the 15-minute drive. When they finally did arrive on the scene, although they hadn't said it out loud, the reactions of the stunned paramedics suggested that they put the victim's chances of survival at nil. When the ambulance dropped Allison off at the hospital after a ride that had taken much longer than it should have, emergency room doctors got to work straight away on the young woman who had sustained more injuries than a body could normally withstand. 
Even so, believing that where there was life, there was hope, they had put everything they had into bringing their patient, who had shown a remarkable will to live, back from the brink of death. Tyan, who had followed first responders to the hospital, stayed close by until Allison was stabilized. The man she referred to as her knight in shining armor had earned his title and then some. Miraculously, none of the fifty-odd stab wounds had hit an artery or vital organ. What's more, since Allison's intestines had been emptied due to the strangulation, her abdominal cavity hadn't turned septic. Even though they were covered in dirt and debris, her gaping wounds had shown no signs of infection. As a result of the horrific injuries to her throat, a tube had been inserted into Allison's windpipe to aid in her breathing. When detectives brought a book filled with photos of potential suspects to the hospital only hours after the attack, she had picked out Franz Dutoit and the Inns Kruger as her assailants. Eager to get the murderous duo off the streets before they could strike again, she had then shared everything she remembered of the events that would forever alter the course of her life. Though she wasn't able to speak, she had been able to provide a written account, which included the four names of the perpetrators. When this evidence was presented to prosecutors, they asked that her physician remove the tube from her windpipe so that she could verbalize the names. They explained that, in their experience, spoken words had more impact at judicial hearings than writings on a piece of paper. Both doctor and patient agreed to the request. When the tube was removed, Allison smiled and remarked that it felt wonderful to be rid of the intrusive device. She had then spoken the names of the men who had done their best to take her life for all to hear. And with that, detectives went looking for the unsavory pair. Owing to their prior run-ins with the law, they hadn't been hard to find. One of the suspects, Franz Dutoit was a 26-year-old husband and father with a criminal history that included violent attacks on women. While he had been accused of rape on multiple occasions, he had gotten off time and again with a slap on the wrist, which may have had something to do with the fact that his father was a police officer. Besides his reputation as a sex offender, Franz had also displayed a proclivity for arson, having set fire to a schoolhouse as a teenager. A fringe dweller who had a hard time abiding by the rules of society, after getting romantically involved with a self-proclaimed dark witch, he had allegedly declared himself a disciple of Satan. The other half of this dastardly duo was even more of a wild card than his partner. 19-year-old Dianz Kruger was trouble walking on two legs. As opposed to his cohort's upbringing, Dianz had grown up living hand-to-mouth in an allegedly abusive household. His father, rather than being in law enforcement, was a career criminal who had been in and out of prison throughout much of his son's childhood. Proving that birds of a feather flocked together, he too had dabbled in Satanism. While Franz may have fancied himself a ladies' man, Dianz had no such delusions. With neither looks nor intellect to his credit, he was someone who most women found repulsive. Stunned by the constant rejection, he had grown to hate the opposite sex almost as much as he wanted them sexually. When Franz was interrogated by police regarding what happened to Allison, he had assumed that he was being questioned about a murder. When he was informed that his victim had survived, he had rolled over faster than a potato bug. Realizing that authorities had him dead to rights, Franz had handed over a ring caked in blood that was identified as belonging to Allison Bota. If there had been any lingering doubts as to his involvement, all such thoughts were erased in that moment. When Allison was able, she was asked to pick her attackers out of a lineup. Her case would be the first in the history of the South African legal system in which a one-way mirror was used to protect a victim from having to come face to face with their alleged assailants. Even though they had altered their appearances in an attempt to skirt justice, Allison had easily pointed out Franz and the Huns. In spite of their efforts to throw her off, their faces had been burned into her memory. The pair, who were subsequently dubbed the Ripper Rapists by the media, were charged with kidnapping, rape and attempted murder. Not long after being taken into custody, Franz announced that he was possessed by a demon and in need of an exorcism. Surprisingly, his jailers arranged for a man of the cloth to perform the ritual. Whether it worked or not is unknown. In the end, it didn't matter, neither the public nor the court system had sympathy for this particular devil. The trial began on June 12, 1995. 
Before the day was over, one of the defense lawyers withdrew his services for ethical reasons. No one familiar with the horrific details of the case could blame him. As the defendants were led to and from court each day, Detective Melvin Humpel, who had headed the investigation, refused to shackle his wards. The blue blood pumping through his veins, he had let them know in no uncertain terms that he hoped they would make a run for it so he could give them the punishment they deserved. Franz and the Uns, convinced that the straight arrow meant business, had behaved like model prisoners in his presence. During the proceedings, two prior victims had taken the stand to recount their ordeals at the hands of the accused. Both testified that they had been warned by their attackers not to go to police. Though they had sworn to keep the rapes to themselves, the women one of whom had been visibly pregnant at the time of the assault had gone straight to authorities upon their release. Franz and the Uns were quickly arrested but were back out on the streets before the ink on their warrants was dry. A third woman, who had narrowly escaped their clutches, testified that she had been driving around looking for a parking space at around 12.30 p.m. on December 16, 1994, two days before Allison was abducted when she noticed two scary-looking characters watching her. As she pulled into an open space, she observed the men moving rapidly towards her car. Her survival instincts kicking in, she had stayed put and locked the doors. When they realized that she wasn't getting out and they weren't getting in, the pair had fled. Later on, she recognized their faces from the news reports of Allison's brutal assault and attempted murder. On August 7, the court rendered its verdict, guilty on all charges. The presiding judge sentenced both Franz and the Uns to life in prison. He was so appalled by their callousness and lack of humanity that he had taken the unprecedented step of including a caveat that they never again be allowed to see the light of day. The pair, whose violent tendencies seemingly know no bounds, remain incarcerated today, although they're eligible for parole every few years. So far, the board has wisely chosen to keep them locked up for everyone's sake. To date, neither has shown an ounce of remorse for their attack on Allison. Following a recovery that her own doctors described as nothing short of miraculous, Allison was released from the hospital after three weeks. With a long road ahead of her, she continued her rehabilitation on an outpatient basis. With Franz and the Uns behind bars where they belonged, Allison began the long process of taking back her life. Though she had been understandably mired in depression for quite some time, she pulled herself out of the pit of despair when she realized that she had a story that needed to be told. Rather than letting her attackers take more from her than they already had, she opted to use what she had learned from her experiences to help others, which in turn, did wonders for her own emotional healing. Her life back on track at last, Allison married and became a mother to two sons. This was yet another victory for the woman whose assailants had admitted that they had deliberately tried to destroy her female organs. Once again, Allison's strength and determination had won out over their unspeakable acts of cruelty. In 2016, a book called I Have a Life, Allison's Journey as Told to Mary and Them was published. Later that same year, a documentary about the near-fatal events and their aftermath was produced. The film, aptly titled Allison, was lauded by audiences and critics alike as a triumph of the human spirit. When Franz got wind that a film was being made about the case, he had offered to be interviewed, but only if Allison would submit a handwritten letter of forgiveness in advance. What's more, he also asked for a share of the proceeds from the documentary and book, as well as a cut of the earnings Allison received from her speaking engagements. By his warped way of thinking, she wouldn't have had these opportunities if not for him, so he should be entitled to share in the spoils. Unwilling to be pawns in his twisted game, Allison and her team refused to entertain his ridiculous demands. Tyan Eilert, the man who had saved Allison's life on that dark stretch of road, was so deeply affected by the incident and its aftermath that he decided to shelve his plans to be a veterinarian. Instead of treating animals, he enrolled in medical school and became a doctor. Years later, he would help deliver the second child of the woman he had once pulled from the clutches of death on a lonely December night. Detective Melvin Humpel, who had worked tirelessly to bring the perpetrators to justice, died in February of 2020 from a massive heart attack. The man who had been hailed as a hero by both Allison and the public at large was only 63 at the time of his passing. On the other side of the equation, 
Two years after his son's heinous crimes came to light, Franz Dutoit's father committed suicide. His career in law enforcement damaged beyond repair, he apparently couldn't live with the shame that his own flesh and blood had brought upon the family. Alison Bota continues to share her incredible story of survival with audiences across the globe. A shining example of the power of the human spirit, she serves as an inspiration to victims everywhere who have encountered unadulterated evil and live to tell the tale. And there you have it, five tragic crimes that will never be forgotten. We hope that by sharing their stories, we can honor the victims and their families, and raise awareness about the importance of crime prevention and justice. Thank you for watching, and please feel free to share this video to help spread the word.